Okay, so decided uh, this year to give you guys kind of a peek into the development process here, uh, flying the auto, how we how we come up with things, how we come up with ideas, how we iterate and, and get the best possible design uh, by kind of going into the specifics of the reroute. So this one, we actually didn't start it that long ago, uh, but it was it was a pretty big one. There's there's there a whole lot of time invested in this one, believe it or not. So. Um, so to start off with, who here doesn't know why you want to reroute for your NA or NB beyond? Okay. So I will go over that briefly. The short version is stop routing. The water comes into the front of the engine, it gets hot, and then it goes right back out of the front of the engine. So there is a little bit of water that comes out of the back, but the majority of the engine goes right back out the front. So the rear cylinders don't get cooled sufficiently, um, you get uneven cooling, uh, all that kind of stuff. Now the good news is that your temp sensors are all on the back of the head, so that's giving you the worst case scenario. The bad news is that the temperature is not, uh, not even across. So the idea behind reroutes in general is to make it so that the cooling is even. Uh, it's more intelligent flow, it comes into the front of the engine, it cools down the cylinders, it goes out of the back of the engine, the water gets cool, the whole process starts over again. So that's, and Mazda knows that's the way to do it because that's how the engine was in the front wheel drive applications uh, and in the NC and in the ND both, they have setups to have that kind of routing from the factory. Uh, so the bad news, NC and ND owners, I don't have a shiny reroute to sell you. Uh, the good news, you don't need one. Because you already have so, so that is what a reroute. Yes. You could look at that. Yeah, the, a little more history there. The, so the engine came out of a 323, a front wheel drive application to start off with. That had the correct routing. When they put it transverse, they flipped it, or longitudinal rather, when they flipped it sideways, now there's no room, as far as Mazda is concerned, at the back of the head to have the coolant come out where it did in a front wheel drive application. So they said, well, that's okay. We'll just have the heater core come out there and we'll bring the water out of the front of the engine, which is okay in an un understressed engine. But is once you start pushing it farther um, and you're pushing it harder and you're generating more heat, you have to shed that heat, uh, it is, it is, not great. It's a problem. Yes. I heard that the Mazda speed uh, head gasket mm -hmm. change that situation. Is that true? Yeah. So the, the question is the Mazda speed head gasket uh, changed that situation. Did the Mazda speed head gasket change that situation, I guess? Um, I think it's actually the 01 head gasket where they made some changes to the, to the different sizes. So they're my, my understanding is not great, but they kind of sort of mandating it. And from what I have gathered, you know, from other people and such, it's maybe better, but it does not solve the problem. I mean, the routing is still the same. Um, and you can use a reroute on a car with one of those head gaskets. You know, if you have the head off of it, yeah, go ahead and put a, a normal, you know, 94, uh, 99 head gasket on it. Uh, but if you have one on to start off with, should make that big of a difference. So, so that's, that's basically why you want to reroute in general. Um, there have been a, a bunch of different options out on the market. Some of them are kind of terrifying. Some of them are <laughs> actually really good. Um, but we kind of figured we could do better. Um, one of the one of the main reasons we wanted to, one of the things I've wanted to do for, for a while now, um, last year we worked with uh, our local university here, Colorado Mesa University, uh, on analyzing, uh, doing a, a thermodynamic analysis of the Miata's cooling system. And there are a number of things that we discovered there that um, were kind of, basically created a list that we could look at as potentials, I guess, as a short version. But one of the big things that came out of that is that the turbo, not surprisingly, creates a lot of heat. So the, the turbo increases the coolant temperature by itself uh, by as much as the engine does. Now, there is a qualifier. 
the mass of coolant going through the turbo is quite a bit smaller than the mass of coolant going through the engine. And the temperature increase is the same between those two different volumes, those two different masses. So it's not, you know, yes, super dramatic salesman. Yeah, it's the same thing. Well, it's, you know, but it's still bad. It's still a pretty significant increase. The other part of the equation is that water-cooled turbos need to be water-cooled when you shut the engine off. They actually don't need to be water-cooled during operation. So it's oil-cooled during operation. And the reason, part of the reason the Garrett's that we use last so long, except for this one, is that um, the, is because of the water cooling, but the water cooling comes into play after you shut the engine off. So you shut the engine off, and there's, there's a whole Garrett white paper on it if you want to really nerd out, but the short version is, it's something called thermal siphoning, which basically puts the heat into the coolant. The coolant, even though it's not flowing, still carries it away from the turbo, and that prevents your oil from cooking. So that's why you want a water-cooled turbo, and that's why we were not willing to give up the water cooling. I mean, that, that just it never came up, because no, why would we do that? That's stupid. But you don't really need it during operation. So with that in mind, and admittedly, this was kind of, kind of a happy coincidence, but we wanted to decrease the flow of coolant through the turbo, because that puts less heat into the coolant, and what heat does go into the coolant, we wanted to get rid of, which means we want to put it in the heat exchanger or the radiator. So that's the idea. That's kind of where we where we went with everything there. So, like I was saying uh, earlier in, my, in the new products, st typical turbo routing, and this applies to the Mazda Speed as well. Mazda did this exact same thing. It takes hot water from the engine, it makes it hotter, and it puts it right back into the engine. <clears throat> Excuse me, no cooling whatsoever. So. As I mentioned earlier, what we wanted to do, there's, without making it really, really complicated, there's no way to get cool water to the turbo. And it doesn't really matter because you're not really cooling off the turbo during operation. So we're still getting hot water to the turbo. We're still making the water hotter. But then instead of putting that, instead of running a lot of water through there, and instead of running that hot water straight back into the engine, we're running less, so we're putting less load into the coolant, and we are putting that uh, heat into the heat exchanger. So it can dump that heat, at least, hopefully, uh, you know, as much as possible, kind of thing. So, so that's, that was kind of the idea, the big premise. So now, obviously, we wanted to do the best job possible. We wanted to maximize the flow area. Um, we wanted to minimize the failure points so, as I mentioned earlier, minimizing failure points means as few individual pieces as possible, and it means using factory gaskets and proven, not band-aid kind of ways to seal things up. So, as I mentioned earlier, factory gaskets on all the surfaces, the, um, again, use your imagination hat, this is aluminum, I promise. Um, and put, uh, and, this, and this has the thermostat neck O-ring in it, no schmutz, Nothing like that, an O-ring, just like Mazda intended it, exact same dimensions, of course, Mazda O-ring. So um, do that, and then also have the thermostat as close to the head as possible for the quickest possible response. So the farther the thermostat gets away from the head in terms of you know, coolant distance, if you will, you know, if the thermostat is right in the head, awesome, that's the best possible situation. If you've got a remote thermostat that has two feet of hose, between the thermostat and the head, that's not good. You know, you kind of have to band-aid your way around getting the thermostat to react appropriately in that kind of situation. So that was one of our goals. Um, we wanted to make sure there were different uh, temperature options available for the thermostat, and we wanted to make sure uh, that all of the sensors had to work. So the ECU sensor has its own ground, so no worries, it doesn't matter, you can put it in the plastic spot, no big deal. The gauge sensor uh, grounds through the housing that it's in and through the engine and you know, so on and so forth. So if it's electrically insulated, if the sensor is electrically insulated from the engine, it's not gonna work or it's gonna work really inconsistently. So that was another one of our design parameters to make it work. Uh, and it had to be economical. I mean, you, you know, we, we could have, made the most amazing thing in the world, the $1,000, and we would have sold one of them, and then 
everybody would have had to go home without a paycheck that day. So, um, so it had to be economical. And as I mentioned earlier, not all of our things are made in the U.S., but we try to keep everything domestic as much as possible. Um, and that was one of the things that we tried really hard to do and succeeded uh, in doing with with this piece. So it's all, you know, maybe the silicone hose is made elsewhere. I'm honestly not sure, but the uh, the hard parts, literally and figuratively, um, are are made in the U.S. So, so um, we started this whole process uh, with lasers. So we've got a uh, 3D scanner. Um, we fired that guy up. We scanned this super gross engine here, um, and we did that so that we could see what kind of spaces we were working with. And you. You may notice that this is a 99 engine, but it has a cam angle sensor in it. Well, that's a weird combination. Well, that's a possible combination. So we put basically kind of worst case scenario type of stuff to start off with. We scanned it and got it in our magical CAD system here. So this, kind of hard to see, sorry about that. Um, and it's now occurred to me that I can't operate anything with just one hand. Um, but. You can see what's going on here. This this is a 3D scan of the engine. You know, it's, it comes out a little weird, but it's it's still fairly visible. A cam angle sensor, coils, EGR valve, valve cover, intake manifold, so on and so forth. So this is this is obviously the final design. There are all sorts of iterations in here, but you can see that we've got everything designed. We've got the EGR pipe in here, so we can carefully, basically design the reroute around the EGR pipe uh, to make sure that everything fits appropriately. And uh, guys, you're, you're welcome to come up later and take a look at it, but we went through a number of different prototypes. You know, we have super clunky first version to kind of proof of concept to make sure that we were onto something in terms of the, the coolant flow uh, theory. Uh, we, we then went to this one, which worked really well, but I tried to push the EGR fitment a bit much, and it did not fit. Also, this one required a second piece there to hold the thermostat in place, which probably would have worked, but is another failure point. So we didn't want that. We wanted as few failure points as possible. So we moved on from that. We came up with this guy, which I, I think would have worked pretty well and has some advantages to it. Um, but it is a very complicated piece to machine. This, this the final piece is actually also quite complicated, but this one's even more so. Um, so there goes our price point. You know, yeah, we can make it, but are we actually going to sell any because it's so expensive? So you've got to, you know, unfortunately, got to consider all the different parameters. Plus, this one has a joint in the middle, so one more potential failure point. So we wanted to minimize that as much as possible. Um, and then finally, and, and by the way, there are probably another 33 prints of just small iterative changes uh, that I'm not bothering to show you because they kind of all look the same or it all blends together eventually. So, um, but this, this was our final guy right here. So this is the plastic version. This is the metal version. Um, and if you, just FYI, if you guys are looking at this really closely, this is a prototype. There are things on here um, such as the really sharp edge in here, that is not production. That is a difficult thing to machine that they needed some custom tooling for, um, and our timeline basically didn't allow that. So, grain of salt with this guy, it is 95% of the way there, but it is not 100% of the way there. The production ones will be cleaner than this. So, um, so we, like I said, this was kind of our proof of concept. So we bolted this thing up there, Mostly waterproof, eh, maybe like eighty percent watertight. <laughs> made a huge mess in the dino room, but that's fine. We tried to keep it contained. <laughs> so we, um, you can kind of see there was a radiator on this. Um, there's a flow meter over here. Um, our our poor abused turbo friend. I, we actually have absolutely no idea where this came from, but I would not trust it in the car anymore. It's been sitting out for a long time. But you can see we've got a flow meter on this guy as well. So. We, we basically uh, put all the gauges on there to make sure uh, that it was going to flow appropriately. You know, this guy um, had okay, a decent flow through the turbo. Uh, and again, we don't want a lot, 
like I was talking about earlier. But this one had decent flow through the turbo. But I was, you know, unlike this one, I was a little optimistic, or excuse me, a little conservative on the EGR flow. So we put our EGR space. So it was real tight in here. So we saw a pretty good hit to the uh, flow through the radiator with this with this guy. So that went out the window for that reason. Plus it's just giant and ugly, honestly. Um, so we, we kind of went through everything to make sure that we at least matched uh, the stock flow, if not improved upon it. And again, we, we still wanted flow through the turbo. The flow had to be in the right direction and the flow also had to be in a worst case scenario. So that's a, that's a thermostat. Uh, you may notice it looks a little goofy. It's because it's welded open. So we put it in a pot of boiling water, got it all the way open, clamped it down, welded it open, and there you go. That's an open thermostat that we don't have to run at full operating temperature. Um, we did the same thing with the stock one so that we could compare full open. Uh, because if you, if you consider the design here, when your thermostat is closed, yeah, most of your water flow is gonna go through the turbo. But once your thermostat is open, the water flow through the, through the turbo is going to decrease, but we wanted to make sure there was still well, again, not a lot. We don't really want to put a ton of water through there, but we do want to make sure that there is flow through it. So, um, so that was kind of how we, we went through all the different things. And it was super ugly, but it, it got the job done. So once we, once we had kind of, once we had narrowed it down to the general design that we wanted, we then, and we knew we had clearance on this specific setup, then we had to test everything else. Does it work on a 1.6? Well, 1.6 doesn't have EGR, but the coils are on the opposite side. So is it gonna clear that? Almost. So that's what, that's what this little cutout over here is for. You need that on a 1.6. Just detail stuff like that. And check EGR clearance, you know, that's a 99 EGR. Does it work on a 94, 97? Because that's a different EGR. Tweak it a little bit for that. Does it work with our EGR? Oh, well, our, our EGR, actually has a lot more clearance, but that means that we can't have the ECU coolant temp sensor where we thought we wanted it, so now we have to move that. So it's, it's just gone down the line, finding problems, solving problems, to make sure that ideally, we find all the problems, we address all the problems, and you guys just bolt it off, no problem. So, so that was uh, kind of where, where we went. Um, and as you guys have, probably most, most of you, walked up here and seen it. Um, this is the design we ended up with. You can see how the fitment ends up on the on the engine here. Um, again, I went through this earlier, but uh, we've got a bleeder right here. Um, it doesn't have like a giant pocket of air that's likely to get caught in there or anything, uh, but it does make it quite a bit easier to fill. It's just, if you can spit air out right there, that makes it easy. We include a little length of clear hose, so you're not just spilling water all over the back of the, of the engine and the transmission there. Um, so you can actually have it up here um, and anyway, make less of a mess theoretically see when you start to fill it up, all that fun stuff. Um, you've got a, a hole, one eighth MPT hole over here uh, for your aftermarket coolant temp sensor gauge if you have one. If you don't, no worries, don't use it. Um, heater core right here, turbo in. So out from this from this root, from this body um, and into the turbo right here, and then back in again, kind of one of the big advantages back in from the turbo right here. So, um, and you can see it, it's, it's snug. There's not a lot of space back there. Um, one of the problems actually with this setup is it, yeah, it cleared the firewall, but not by a whole lot. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I could fit it on this car, but that guy's car it might not work on. You know, if he has cooked engine mounts or whatever else, excuse me, then it, then it probably won't fit. Or maybe it fits, but you've got to scrape it against your firewall in order to get it in. Well, no one wants to do that. So again, iteration after iteration after iteration. So, um, and then how it all turned out, um, Awesome, in my humble opinion. I'm probably the most biased of anyone here, so, you know, <laughs> grain of salt, I suppose. But um, but I, I'm really, really happy with it. So kind of looking at, at flow area, so the actual area that's, that's in there, um, it has about 8% more than the stock setup because the stock thermostat neck is actually fairly small on the interior there because the cast wall is very thi uh, thick. 
So the machine built while we have here is thin. Still plenty strong, of course. Have you installed that on an in-place engine yet? Oh yeah, yeah, we've installed it on three different cars on engines and cars. Yeah. And that final piece? Well, the aluminum piece. Well, this final okay. piece. This final piece is three hours old, as far as I'm concerned, so, so no. There's a slot there, like you, give, you start the bolt first and then slide that down into place. Oh, this? Yeah. Yeah, that was in the design. I mean, really, if you look at the very first one, there's a slot on there, because I knew I wanted that, because it just drops down into place easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have the top one, but not the bottom one. Yes. Yeah, so the top one, um, yeah, just goes through there. And to answer Brian's question, wherever he is, put the bolt in the housing, put the housing down into place. <laughs> the six inch bolt gets way shorter when it's mostly inside of this thing. <laughs> yeah, valid question though, valid question for sure. And this one was going to be slotted for a long time, but we, you know, the, part of the problem is that the ECU, I'm digressing slightly here, but the ECU, has to see pre-thermostat water. If it sees post-thermostat water, it's not always and, and typically, frequently not an accurate representation of the temperature that's in the engine. So with this cavity right here, getting coolant to the ECU temp sensor prior to, um, prior to the thermostat it was a challenge. So, but we, you know, we got it figured out. And let's see, yeah, over here, oh, 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 it was really ugly. But um, you can see that the cavity is on the top. That makes more sense, right? Well, with the thermostat down low, there's not enough EGR. You can't have enough clearance. And, and even, actually, the thermostat doesn't fit in here right now because the, that chamfer that's supposed to be in there isn't there. But it does fit. It fits nicely, you know, in the final version. You can see the, the printed one has a real nice, smooth chamfer in there and the thermostat, that's fine. But, but anyway, point being, making it so that the coolant gets to all the places it needs to and that the specific type of coolant as a pre or post thermostat, all that makes a difference. So anyway, long story short, 8% more flow area than stock, five to 10% more than our previous offer, offerings. Sorry, I'll hold that closer. Um, stock gaskets, as I've kept harping on, no one wants a coolant leak. Um, the thermostat is literally in the head. So qu quick as possible response, which means that your temperature is gonna be as stable as possible. No, no ups and downs as the thermostat opens and closes because it takes so long for the coolant to get to the thermostat. It just stays stable the whole time. Um, bleeder, uh, as I mentioned on the top right there, and, the, and then EGR fitment, like I said, going through everything. Yeah. Is that deeper than the M2 unit? So the question is, is that deeper than the M2 unit? I think it's shallower. Oh, okay. Not a hundred percent on that. It's way better flow. The, yeah, the reason I was asking is I, I have pulled an engine out with the M2 unit in the back mm -hmm. with the transmission mm -hmm. out the top for those of us who don't have a lift. Mm -hmm. And it is quite tight. Yes. Yes, and that is, so, so he's, he's saying that he has an M2, which is, excuse me, a previous, previous version of the reroute. You know, I, I think this one has some pretty gigantic improvements on that one, honestly. Um, but the M2 is not a bad setup, and it's, it's still the exact same concept. Um, so, and he's saying that it's, it's very tight to pull an engine plus transmission with the reroute still installed out of the engine bay. Yeah. I, I'm not going to argue with you there. <laughs> and, and this is probably going to be pretty comparable. I honestly don't remember or don't know which one is deeper. I think they're pretty comparable. Maybe this one's a little deeper. I don't know. It has plenty of clearance on the firewall, but if you're pulling an engine, you're probably going to want to pull the reroute out first, or at least pay very close attention to it. It's not fragile, but you know, you're going to scratch it up. Placing the thermostat is right, you have to be careful that it stays in place. Mm -hmm. Or when you tighten down the housing, mm -hmm. you can fracture that. Mm -hmm. Have you addressed that here? Because this is on the back of the engine, it's gonna be a little hard to see mm -hmm. if that thermostat is fully seated. Yeah, so what he's saying is um, for the stock thermostat, there's a little counterbore that the thermostat recesses into, and if that shifts prior to, um, if that shifts prior to tightening it down, 
you can have a leak, you can break something, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm um, actually, God, can you run into uh, Jeremy's office and get the hardware back off of this desk, please? Um, so uh, short version, there's a retaining ring. You put the thermostat in, you put the retaining ring in, the thermostat is not going anywhere and you don't have to worry about it. Is that a different thermostat I see on the It is a different the, thermostat. Because on the stock one, they say buy four and put them all in a boiling pot of water and two of them won't work, so use the ones that open up. Yeah, I don't know if it's quite that bad, but it, it is not a stock thermostat. This is actually, um, thank you, sir. Uh, this is one that we just got at our local store, but this this one is our stance super stack. Um, so it's it's got some it's got some neat stuff in there, but anyway, point me it's it's a higher end, higher quality thermostat. Um, it is a smaller footprint than this, uh, but it's about the same in terms of the actual flow size. Because if you if you look at and again, apologies, I know you guys are far away. You're welcome to come up once we're done. But if you look at the size of the thermostat, not the ring, not the not the outside diameter, but the inside diameter, it's fairly close between these two. The outside diameter is quite a bit bigger, but the inside diameter is pretty comparable. So yeah, it is a different term stuff. Yeah, but it should be, yeah. But it also should be uh, readily available. You, know, I, you may have trouble finding the stant super stat specifically, um, but I was able to go down to Napa uh, with part number and pick one up off the shelf. So, um, and there is, there's no bleeder, uh, jiggle valve, whatever, in the thermostat, but there is a tiny little groove in there uh, to let a little bit of coolant uh, bypass and let air get out and that type of thing. So, does the kit include the thermostat? It does, yeah. So, the kit includes everything. Um, there is going to be, as I mentioned earlier, a separate turbo fitment kit. Uh, that turbo fitment kit is going to be these two hose barbs. Um, a new uh, fitting at the turbo, uh, new water lines and heat sleeve and crush washers uh, for the turbo, a new uh, water line and, uh, well, I just can't see it, but anyway, where the, where the turbo water is originally sourced from, from the, between the thermostat housing and the water pump, we're including a new length of hose there so that you can replace what you used to have and then route it the new way uh, with, you know, with, the, with the better routing. So, short version, you'll have everything you need to, to put it together. So, um, this is, honestly, I tore through it this morning, so this is probably a complete hardware kit, but I have to make sure, because it was a little bit of a rush this morning. Um, but, let's see if I can do this single-handedly. Um, there is a metal retaining ring in there. It's actually pretty slick. I have not used these before, um, it's not really a C-clip, so you don't have to have the, the goofy C-clip. All right, I give up, I'm using my hand. Okay, you don't have to use uh, the, the pin pliers, the, the goofy kind of annoying C-clip guys. This is pretty thin because it's so tight back there. But we also, there's no load. It's not like there's a whole lot of thrust that we're trying to hold back. We're just keeping the thermostat in place. So. Um, pretty thin, pretty flexible, uh, has a little, you guys probably really can't see that. There's a little notch in there so that you can easily put a flathead in there and just boop, pop it out when you need to pop it out. Easy, super easy to deal with, no big deal. Um, I'm sorry? How often do you need to replace it? So the question is how often do you need to replace it? Um, ideally never. I mean, really when your thermostat goes back or if you decide that you don't want a 180 degree thermostat, you want a 195 or something like that. Uh, so should not be a very frequent occurrence. Um, I only have one more note here. Uh, complete kit is 299, probably out in about a month. Uh, my guess, this is a little, the, the 299 is set in stone. A uh, little bit more of a guess is the turbo fitment kit, probably gonna be about 60 bucks but I need to look at that uh, to kind of, you know, don't hold me to that, but probably in that vicinity. So, and with that, questions, I'm seeing some hands, lots of hands. He's had his hand up for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Can the uh, kit include like a nice 
nice fitted hose, or is it uh, going to be something more? So, so he's asking if the kit is going to include a fitted hose. I would really like to, honestly, and we may very well do that in the future. Uh, but for right now, it's the same standard silicone straight hose uh, that conforms pretty easily. So I, I have some ideas for hose and for other things that I'd like to kind of improve it. Two problems with that. The biggest one, quite honestly, is timing. Um, we're, we've already missed a fair amount of this track season, and I did not want to push it out any farther. Uh, and that honestly does work really well. Um, the second problem with that is cost. Um, we wanted to stay as competitive as possible, and with a custom form hose, I don't think we would be. So we will, I'll tell you this, we will definitely investigate a custom fitted hose. I would really like to do that, but I want to do one. And if we've got to do five, that's pretty much a deal breaker for our kinds of, you know, we're still a small company when it really comes down to it and, and small volumes and that kind of thing. So anyway, I would really like to hold tight. Hopefully, can't promise. <laughs> um, I saw some other hands. No, it'll be silicone soft lines. Um, and I, we talked about that few different problems. For one, if it's a non-FM kit, hardline kit won't work. Um, it's going to be pretty close to the exhaust manifold. So the stainless would work really well, but it would also transfer heat really well. So we don't want to do that. And it's going to be a little bit of a uh, kind of convoluted, I guess, routing in there. So maybe but I'm gonna guess no, because the routing is, is gonna be a little weird depending on how your brake lines are, how your heat shield is. You have to be able to remove the heat shield without having to remove the turbo water lines. So I really like our stainless hard lines. I'd like to do it. I'm afraid the reality of it is that it just doesn't make sense, but we will look at that more closely. I got you, but hang on. So the question is, what, what coolant mix did we use, did it matter, and what would we use in real life? So we, we went through a lot of, a lot of water. Um, we did do a coolant mix the first time. Uh, we did pressurize it the first time as well. So we knew that the plastic prototypes would not hold up to pressurization. We were pretty confident it wasn't, and pretty confident it would be pretty dramatic when it failed. Um, so we, so we tested with the stock setup, which obviously can hold uh, pressure first. We tested it with pressure, we tested it without pressure, we found zero difference in the flow. So that kind of confirmed that we could test it without pressure with the plastic ones, because quite frankly, we couldn't have tested it uh, if we needed to hold pressure. Um, as, as far as the coolant ratio, we probably should have put more coolant in to be completely honest, because it's not good for water pumps to run on just water. They need lubrication, and that comes from the, the coolant, the antifreeze. Um, this is a core anyway. No one's reusing this water pump. Um, it was pretty ugly in there to start off with, so I don't know that we could have made it much worse. And we just went through more and more and more and more. So we would have been throwing away antifreeze, and that's the price of development sometimes, but we would have been throwing away a lot of it for not really much of a reason. So to answer your question, we just use water for the vast majority of it. Um, as far as a coolant ratio that I would recommend for you, typically it's 70% distilled water, make sure it's distilled water, with antifreeze. Um, that will vary for your, for your specific conditions. You know, 50-50 is what manufacturers always recommend, but water transfers heat better than coolant does. So a 70-30 mix is gonna cool better than a 50-50 mix. So like when I'm talking to people about a turbo install, make sure you do the cheap and easy stuff. A 70-30 mix is on that list. Make sure you do a 70-30 mix as long as it's okay for your winter conditions. And that's still good to like zero degrees Fahrenheit or something, maybe 10 degrees. It's, it's cold. It's definitely well below freezing. Um, and that'll give you the lubrication for the, for the pump as well. So if you're running track and you need the best possible cooling and you don't care about freezing, run water with a bottle of water water. So, um, 
you had a question, I think. Yeah, is the turbo set up for a stock turbo, monster speed turbo? So, I, that's a good question I had. So the question is, will the turbo fitment kit work for a monster speed turbo as well? Um, I'll give you two answers and... Yes and no. To, no, not yes and no, yes. I'll give you two answers and then in, in maybe a couple of weeks, uh, I'll stick with one of those. So either there will be a Mazda Speed specific fitment kit or it'll just work the same. So I need to double check that. Yeah, anyway, sorry, <laughs> gears turning. I'll get back to you on that, but there will be a Mazda Speed option. More questions? Yes. Yeah, I only heard eight percent better flow than the stock, mm -hmm. and to me, it didn't translate to three hundred dollars worth. So, help me. You know, what were the what were the overall net cooling efficiencies that you achieved? Sure. So, basically, he's asking eight percent is not very much. Why do I want to spend three hundred dollars on it? That's eight percent in flow area. That doesn't take into account where the coolant is going. That doesn't take into account how the turbo or how the, the turbo water is routing um, and that type of thing. So now, in terms of specific testing um, for you know how much longer can we run with this reroute type of thing, we have not done that testing yet. So the theory is that the reroute anecdotally is pretty thoroughly proven, um, and, and that's most of what you're paying for. Um, the the other part of it, uh, again, is the turbo water, and we know how much heat the turbo adds to it, and we're putting that in a position in which it can be cooled off, as opposed to just increasing the temperature. So the temperature. basically, it's driven by the fact that some of us already have reroute kits. Yeah. Uh, you know. So if yeah, and that's fair. So if you already have a reroute kit, the main it depends on the reroute kit that you have some of them are super goofy some of them are really nice this is a 949. yeah and the 949 is very nice so really the there are a number of improvements in hours over the 949 um, and i could go through that again but the really short version is that's a nice kit if you have a turbo car it might be worth upgrading to this one um, for that turbo water routing if you have a naturally aspirated car ours is better i'm biased but i think ours is better whether it's enough better to spend another 300 bucks on it, maybe not. The 949 really is a very nice kit. Did you say the same thing for the M2 version? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Does it look like it? <laughs> the, it? It is an absolutely fair question. Um, I am much less confident in my answer for that one, I guess. It, so, sorry, the, the question, so the first question was, I have a 949, why, or Super Miata, Qmax, uh, reroute kit, why should I buy yours? Really the short version is the turbo routing is better, otherwise ours is better but probably not enough better to warrant the, the cost. The m tuned kit, <laughs> the m tuned kit is quite a bit smaller in terms of flow area. Um, they clearly had a, and, and this is, I mean it's fine, but they clearly had a three axis mill that they built it on. So there's not very much contouring inside, there are a lot of steps um, and if you don't remember i've got one i could show you okay um and the thermostat is remotely located so you have to drill a pretty big bypass hole in order to get enough coolant to the thermostat to make it react uh, in, a, in a timely fashion basically so if it works for you now awesome no worries it's okay um i would be much more inclined to replace an M-tuned than a Q-Max. That doesn't mean you have to. The M-tuned is still okay. It's not bad. It's better than stock. Um, not as good as ours. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, Brandon, you mentioned that you used Mesa University to help with uh, some of the flows. Mm -hmm. What part did they play in this? So basically, basically they did uh, attempted to do a thermodynamic dynamic analysis of the cooling system. So my request was, look at the cooling system, test it, put sensors on it, tell us where it is deficient and where we can improve things. We had some issues with sensors, there was some time constraints, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we did get some information out of that. 
Um, and one of the things that we got out of it was that the, the turbo, again, added quite a bit of heat to the system. So by not really eliminating that heat, but by managing it better, um, that is the idea here. So does that answer your question? Okay. More questions? Anybody? Anybody? Is the, the air bleed you mentioned, is that something unique to the reroute that you have, that you have this air bleed? And is that, would you explain how that works? Sure, so the question is, is the air bleed unique to the reroute um, and how does it work? So, I mean, I guess so. Um, it is on our reroute and it is not on the stock car, if that answers your question. So, the, the way it works is that when you fill up the radiator, the air has to go somewhere, right? And a lot of it comes out of the radiator cap, but if we can get it out right here, at the highest point in the engine anyway, then we could just fill it that much faster. Honestly, if you didn't use this on ours anyway, if you didn't use this, it'd probably be okay. I would suggest using it. Uh, but it, at the very least, it'll make your life much faster. So it'll just kind of expedite filling the system. Is, is the general advice with uh, with cooler routes if you're filling your radiator, jack the front end of your car up, get your front end up as high as you can? Yeah, so so really the general advice for filling a Miata cooling system, whether you have a reroute or not, is to jack up the front of the car. You know, the, you want your fill point to be the highest point in the system. Yeah. More questions? Okay. Well, that's it. If you guys have any more questions, come up and see me. Um, again, should be on sale in about a month or so. Awesome. Cool. Thank you.